Of the Lord. Amen. Well, if you shook hands with someone, you may be seated. In praying in the Spirit over a period, long period of time about these services, I was led to speak in the evening services on the subject of healing, and I always speak on the subject of prayer in the day services in the winter sem seminar, and so we have and did but also at the close of that prayer time, uh, I, I was led by the Spirit, in other words, it seemed good to me and the Holy Ghost, to have Brother Keith Moore to speak these last two nights on the subject of longevity. We have 350, over 350 employees here at Rainbow Bible Training Center and Kenneth Hagin Ministries and all that's involved. And uh, once a week on Tuesdays, from 1 to 2 o'clock, they have a time of prayer together, reading the Word of God together, pray, and talk about anything needs to be talked about. And Lynette asked Brother Keith if he'd speak to him on faith and healing. Keith graduated from Rhema a number of years ago. Two years that he was in Rhema, he was with us in healing school every day, played the piano, sang, and helped us. Then when he graduated, he just stayed on and helped us free of charge. And after a while, we put him on the payroll. And he's been with us now 13 and a half years, still teaches part-time at school, and helps us immeasurably in our meetings. Uh, we trained him well, as you can see, amen. I call him a divine healing technician. <laughs> Glory to God, amen. So. In teaching to the to the uh, our employees here, he he taught five lessons on longevity. Now I'd studied some along that line, but but he just brought out some many many thoughts, many many scriptures that I hadn't found yet or thought of yet, or hadn't had time to look up. And uh, God has healing for you, but you need to know also that He wants you to live a long time. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Well, how long is long life? Well, he'll tell you from the scriptures how long long life is. Amen. So he's coming immediately after Raymond Singers and band sing. He'll come immediately and take the service. Praise God, I want you to listen carefully and walk in the light of the revelation of the Word of God. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. All right, come right on, Raymond Singers and band. Praise God. Thank you, Lord.
Jesus came into my heart. How many saved folk we got out here tonight? Yeah. Glory to God. Aren't you glad you're saved? Yeah. You know, no matter how your day might be going, you can always shout about, I'm saved. Yeah. I'm saved. Praise God. We're so thankful to be with you tonight and count it such a great honor and privilege. Why don't you stand up and let's pray and, and believe God that... Uh, what the Lord wants accomplished in these teachings that he put on Brother Hagin's heart would be accomplished. Amen. How many understand that what kind of service we have is not just entirely up to the ministry, but we all have a part to play. And, and uh, you know, we'll hear and everybody will yield. The Spirit of God's faithful. He always does his part. So let's pray and believe God. Father, we thank you so much. Thank you for these great meetings. Thank you for this ministry. Thank you for the Word of God. Oh, the Word of God enlightens us, and liberates us, quickens us. Thank you, Lord, for the Spirit of God, our teacher, our helper, our guide. We ask you for utterance, just exactly what you'd have us to say and do. We ask you for ears uh, for the hearers to hear. We ask you for eyes that see, hearts that understand. We pray, Lord, that there would be divine grace deposits, truth impartations of light, truth that sets free. And we purpose by your grace not to be hearers only, but to be doers of the word, walkers in the light. We know as we do, we shall be blessed. We thank you for it. Get glory to yourself in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God. You can be seated. Thank you, Lord. Why don't you turn to the 91st Psalm as I say a few things to you. You ever read the 91st Psalm? Some wonderful things there. The 91st Psalm, we'll read this and then I'll say what I'm about to say. Psalms in the Old Testament. <laughs> psalm 91 of course the whole psalm is just wonderful and great and I know a lot of you have quoted it over yourself many times but let's just begin in verse 14 Psalm 91 verse 14 says because he has set his love upon me now this is the Lord talking God talking because he set his love on me therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high. How many like the sound of that? I'll set him. Have you set your love on him? Then expect to come up. God says, I'll set him on high because he's known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him, glory, with long life. Everybody say long life. Long. long life will I satisfy him, this is the Lord talking, and show him my salvation. Do you believe that? Yes. You believe all those verses? Yes. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. The Jerusalem uh, translation says, I give them life long and full and show them how I can save. Of course, you know, the longer you live, the, long, the more you can see God do things. Right? How many have seen God do some great things just in the last few years of your life? Well, if you live a whole lot longer, you get to see a whole lot more. How many know that we, we are living in the last days? 
right? Somebody said, well, when, you know, when is the culmination of all things and and when are the greatest signs and wonders and miracles? And when is the, the, the full gathering into the harvest? And when is the Lord coming? Well, we know this beyond any question. We're closer to it than anybody has ever been. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And if you live a while, then uh, you could be part of the generation that sees the return of the Lord. If you live a while longer, you, you could see, you know, the things that the prophets have prophesied about. You can see the fullness, the things that others have desired to see and didn't see and have already gone on. So there's a lot of reasons, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but there's a lot of reasons why you ought to stay around. I said there's a lot of reasons why you ought to stay around. And if the Lord told you and told me that he would satisfy us with long life, then we need to wrap both arms around that word and stand fast and make up our minds that no devil, no demon, no disease, no disaster, no crazy people are going to rob us of even one day of what belongs to us in this life. You know, if you lived down here 200 years, that's nothing. I said, that's nothing. It, it, it's here, it's gone. I've talked to people that are over age 100 and sometimes they talk about, they say, you know, it seems like it just a few days ago when I was 14. Or when I, you know, 100 years, 200 years is nothing. So even at a full length span, this life, mortal life, is brief. It's like a vapor. It's here just a little while, it's gone. So it's absolutely foolish for us to cut out, you know, and, and go home early and, and, and be cut short when it's already short to begin with. Can you say amen? amen? The scripture said, with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Longevity has been an interest of mine and the study of mine for a number of years. Uh, probably it had something to do with working in healing school. We've had the privilege of uh, sitting under the Hagans and this ministry for about 16 some years now. And I tell you, I, I cannot put into words what this ministry has, has, has and, and does and will mean to me. Uh, had the privilege of sitting under Brother Hagan's ministry in healing school and being involved in that for, uh, on a daily basis for 13 some years. And uh, just every opportunity you could think of, I was telling a fellow minister the other day, I said, if Keith Moore doesn't make it, it's not God's fault because he's given me every advantage and opportunity and to glean from such wonderful ministries. But, you know, in, in dealing with life and death situations every day, you, you know, month after month, year after year, you think about dying a lot. You're, you're faced with it. People are facing death. And... Um, you'll find that a lot of people have misconceptions about when their life is close to an end or when they're old. Remember the proverb said, as a man thinks in his heart, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Well, if you think you're old when you're 28, and if you think you don't have much time left when you're 35, guess what? So are you. Even though that's not true according to the Bible, that's not true according to God's plan, but if you think that, then that's the way it'll be to you. And so you got all kind of people that are, you know, they, they, they should be thinking they're young. They should be thinking they're in midlife, but they think they're old. And if you think you're old, and you believe you're old, and you talk old, and you think you hadn't got much longer left, and you say you hadn't got much longer left, then it'll be according to what you believe and according to what you say, and people are being cut short all the time and missing out on the fullness and attributing to the mysterious will of God when it's not God's fault. This scripture says, the Lord says, with long life I will satisfy. Now that ought to be a word that really gets in you strong tonight. Everybody say satisfy. satisfy. You know, we're going to talk about some numbers and like Brother Hagin mentioned, how long is long and that kind of thing eventually. But uh, this, this is very, very weighty in this subject, just this one word, satisfy. 
satisfaction. How long should you believe to live? How long should you expect to live? How long should you stand and resist everything that would try to cut you off short? How long? Until you are satisfied. Satisfied. This word satisfied uh, is from the same word that means satisfied after you've had a good meal. Satiated. Full and satisfied. Have you ever had a good meal? Hmm? And for sure you had plenty. Maybe ex beyond that. Maybe extra beyond that. And I mean you, there's no, no, no way that you didn't have enough. No way that you were cut short. You got full and maybe then some and maybe pushed back from the table and the plate and go, whoo, glory. Man. That was good. I mean, we've had the privilege of going down to a, a Brother Leroy and Sister Carolyn Church in Darrow and had the privilege of eating some of that fine cooking. Boy, you, ha you hadn't eaten unless you had some of Sister Carolyn's uh, uh, Cajun cooking. And boy, I've, I've done that down there. Eventually push back and go, whoo, brother. <laughs> I'm satisfied. I've had plenty. I've had enough to, to the point where even though, no matter how wonderful it tastes, you don't want any more. Have you ever been there? That's the way we need to be with life. That we have lived life, we have tasted life, we have seen the goodness of God, we have pursued the ministry and call on our lives, we have done everything that God put in our heart to do. We've experienced all the blessings that God told us we would experience. We've seen everything that he told us we would see and we get to the end of a long, full life and we just rear back and go, I'm satisfied. I've seen it all. I've done it all. I've had it all. I'm satisfied. That's when it's time to go and not before then. Listen to what the scripture says concerning the patriarchs, uh, concerning Abraham when he died at age 175. It says he gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years. Everybody say full. full. The Hebrew literally says he was aged and satisfied. Concerning Job. Now, you know, a lot of times when people think about Job, they think about 42 chapters of pain, strain, and suffering. And if they got a problem, I guess I'm like poor old Job. You know, Job wasn't poor in any sense of the word. He had some problems. He had some trials. He had some, had some rough times. But uh, Job's life as a whole was wonderfully amazing. The Bible said concerning Job in Job 42, 16 and 17, you don't have to turn there, but it says after this, everybody say after this. Now that's after all the trials, the tests, you know, he lost his, he, he lost his wealth, he lost his kids, he, he, he was sick, he, he's down to death's door, but after that, you know, he came to the end of that and God restored him, God healed him, God blessed him. After this, he lived 140 years. After that, I don't know how old he was when that happened, but 140 years, so then he died being old and full of days, fullness, fullness. You know, historians and, and scholars tell us that they think probably the whole ordeal of Job happened in less than two years you know, maybe 18 months or so. So he had a bad year. <laughs> I said he had a bad year. Can anybody relate to you? You had some trials, you had some tests. But God got him through. Amen. He had, Job was wrong about some things. Job said some things that wasn't right. He made some mistakes. But then he repented, last couple, last couple of chapters, he repented, he prayed for his friends, God turned his captivity, and he had 140 years to be rich and wise and blessed after that. 
And he was already, if you study it, by, you know, by today's standard, before this happened, Job was a multi-billionaire. Somebody talking about poor old Job. Man, the, the word ought not to be used in connection with the man. <laughs> no matter how, you know, the reason I'm talking about this is because many times people do not live long because they get tired of life. And they wouldn't be tired of life if they had victory. Amen. They're tired of things being the way they are. The, the people get to the point where they don't want to wait to die. They kill themselves. And you got some people, you know, that they're just, you know, their, their main thing every day is to pray for the rapture. <laughs> come, Lord Jesus, please, please come. Come this morning. Come. Come. Well, he is coming, and we ought to be looking for his coming. But a lot of times people are just in an escape mentality. They're going, God, get me out. Get me out. I got bills. <laughs> that's, not, that's not what the Lord wants to come for. The Lord wants to come and, and receive a victorious church, a church walking in the fullness of his power and revelation, a church with their foot on the devil's head. When he comes going, Lord, we're occupying, just like you said, we're ready. So no, no, he is coming and it is soon, but you and I don't need to, you know, have such an escape mentality that, you know, we... Maybe, maybe it'd be right now, maybe it'd be the next month. Well, it could be, but on the other hand, you and I need to be ready to dig in and to serve God with a long, full life. Amen. And do all that we can before all things are fulfilled. Thank God for the promise of longevity. The Lord said, he said in Exodus 23, I'll give you a full lifespan, the NIV says. In Psalm 103, you're familiar with it. It said, he satisfies, as that word again, he satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Renewed. I've heard Brother Hagin say he's not, he's not gonna retire, he just refires. That's scriptural. Renewal. God is a renewer. Do you know that there, according to the word, is a right way and a right season to die, and there's a wrong way and a wrong season to die and to go? In Numbers, the 23rd chapter, you don't have to turn there. I'll have you to turn to some places in a bit, but just listen, jot them down if you want to. Numbers 23.10, the scripture said, Let me die the death of the righteous, and let my last end be like his. There's a death of the righteous, uh, an honorable, a godly, a victorious way to go. Paul talked about in, in uh, Philippians that whether he lived or whether he died, he was going to glorify God, and he would glorify God in his death, just like he would in his life. How many know we, we ought to have a desire and believe God to go out right? Amen. I said to go out right. To go out now, now, as I talk about these things, you may think of people that, that were robbed of some of the years of their life. You may think of situations where people maybe didn't die the best in the most glorious way. Uh, don't, don't let your mind fixate on that. Maybe they didn't know what we're talking about. Maybe they haven't seen. I mean, there's a lot of people who don't believe in healing. There's a lot of people who don't believe in being filled with the Spirit. Uh, not that they're bad people. They just hadn't seen it. But make up your mind that you're going to, if God's given you this promise of longevity and satisfaction, you're going to embrace it. You're going to have it. Yeah. Amen? Amen? You know, uh, one way that's an example of a right way and a good way to go is in Genesis, the 49th chapter, uh, talking about Jacob and when he went and how he went. Do you remember that? You don't have to turn there, but, but Jacob died at age 147. That's pretty good, isn't it? But did you know that he said that when, you know, a few years before this, he said, my days have been few and evil and have not attained unto the days of my father. And it was true, his, his, the patriarchs had lived longer before him, but 147 wasn't long to him, he didn't think. 
But you remember that when it was time for him to go on, he was apparently aged and satisfied. He called all his sons and his family into the room. Remember that? He gathered strength and he sat up in the bed and he looked at them and by faith and by the Spirit of God, he spoke over them and spoke faith words over them. And he, and he prophesied to them about their future and about the directions of their lives. And how many understand this is honorable, isn't it? No tubes, no breathing machines, not delirious from drugs. At his self, in his right mind, flowing in the spirit. Minutes before you're gone, flowing in the spirit. He spoke over his sons, and then the Bible said that he gathered his feet into the bed, and he yielded up the ghost. The NIV said he breathed his last and was gathered to his people. That's the death of the righteous. I said, that's the death of the righteous. There's a right way. <clears throat> There's a right season. Turn with me, if you would, to Hebrews, the ninth chapter. And let's look at a scripture that is often misquoted. You ever heard people supposedly quoting scriptures and, you know, when you actually try to find it in the Bible, it's hard to find? <clears throat> Here's one you hear a lot. God won't put more on you than you can stand. You ever heard that? People say, well, you know, like the Bible says, God won't put more on you than you can stand. Where's that at? I've been in the ministry for a number of years. I hadn't found it. So I said, well, it's in there. Where's it at? A lot of times people are misquoting 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There is no temptation, trial, or test taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. I said, God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tested or tried above that which you're able. But will with the temptation make a way of escape that you might be able to bear. And I said, well, that's saying the same thing. No, it's not. No. You know, uh, one phrase that you'll find that, that people use frequently concerning people and you find it oftentimes if people die in midlife or in, in, in youth, whatever, with a disease or a problem, they'll, they'll use this phrase, God took them. That's really not accurate. There are only two instances that I'm aware of in the Word where that phraseology is accurate. One is concerning Enoch. He, he walked with God and he was not because God took him. And then also, God took Elijah by a whirlwind. So I said, what about all the rest of the folk that died? They went to be with him. Are you with me? They went to be, and the, thing, the reason I say that, and it's more accurate, because when you go to be with him, it's not all up to him. Are you with me now? You know, uh, you're going to Hebrews 9, but just hold your place there. Actually, on the way there was Philippians. Drop by Philippians on the way. On our way to Hebrews. You know this, we could quote this, but I want you to take the time to look at it. Hebrews, the second chapter. <clears throat> um, excuse me. Philippians, the first chapter is where I want you to go right now. Eventually, we're going to get to Hebrews 9. I don't know where that second thing came from. Philippians, the first chapter, verse 20. Paul, who also in Philemon referred to himself as Paul the aged. Remember that? Paul the aged one. So before Paul went, he was old. He says here in Philippians 1.20, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Can you glorify God in your death? Yes, you can. Does every death glorify God? 
No. He went on to say, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now let's just stop right here. Death is not a friend. Death is an enemy. Remember 1 Corinthians 15 talks about it, that the last enemy that will be put underfoot is death. You hear sometimes even preachers talking about death like it's some comforting friend. That at the last sweet death took them. Death is not sweet. Death is rotten. Death is decay. Death is corruption. Death will not be a part of God's final plan. There will come a day soon when there will be no more dying, no more crying, no more pain, no more cemeteries, no more funeral processions, no more hospitals. Thank God. No more cursing the earth. The former things will be passed away. There will be new heavens and new earth in which there is no curse. None. Death is here because of sin. Death is not, uh, you know, uh, something pleasing to God. Death is not f uh, something that God sends to bless us. Death is his enemy. Death is our enemy. You understand? And so Paul said to me to live as Christ, to die as gain. If I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose... I wot not. Wot means to know. For I'm in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to us abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. This, is Paul saying he's got a choice in the matter as to whether he stays or whether he goes? He is. Now you'll hear people misquote Hebrews 9. And if you've got your place, you can turn there and look at it. But Hebrews 9, and you'll hear people say, well, you know, like the Bible said, it's appointed unto man a time to die. You ever heard that? People say, well, you know, like the Bible says, it's appointed unto man a time to die, and when your time comes, you die. And people have the idea that that time might be 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday when you're 20 years old. Or it might be 8 o'clock in the evening on a Monday when you're 90 years old. You just don't know. But there's a, there, there is a mark on the calendar up in heaven somewhere. And when your time comes, the jig is up. Don't make any difference where you're at or what you're doing. When the time comes, that's it. You're out of here. Like it or not, ready or not, you're gone. Now you may have heard, have you, had, have you not heard some of this mentality? People talking about, well, must have been their time. I guess it was just their time. The reality is people die out of their time. People die before their time. I'm going to give you scripture to prove that. But yet that ment that's the mentality. It's kind of like this individual that was a maintenance person on airplanes, but he never would fly. And they're all trying, you know, that's kind of a bad sign, isn't it? They're, that's like the cook that won't eat their own food, you know. Uh, but he, uh, he never would fly. And the, uh, the guys that knew him always trying to get him to go up with them. Come on, go up with me. No, 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 I'm not going. One of them was trying to convince him, and he said, well, you know, you're not going to your time comes anyway. No need for you to be concerned. I mean, you're not going until your time comes. He'd look down, thought about it. He looked at me and said, yeah, but what if I get up there and it comes the pilot's time? <laughs> See that? How does that work? People believe a lot of things. I mean, it's entrenched in them. They've heard it preached from pulpits for generations, but it is wrong. It is unscriptural. It is not Bible. It is not right, but it's robbing people. I said it's robbing people. One reason we're talking about and teaching about these things is because if you don't know your rights, you won't stand up for them. I know not that many months ago, uh, uh, my dad, had a heart attack. 
very serious situation. And I mean, he got so close to death that he said he's, he's seeing over into the spirit realm. I mean, he, he's half gone. And he said right in the middle of that, thank God he had some word in him. Amen. Right in the middle of it, he said he just, he has a relationship with the Lord. He said, Lord, it's not time for me to go, is it? And he said, the Lord said, no. So he fought it and lived. Yeah. And he's alive and fine. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But so easily he could have been gone. You know, working in healing school, we'd have, uh, you know, so-called terminal cases all the time. And uh, every situation of people that we, we, we've been privileged to see then and now and for all these years, many, many people that were given up to die, considered hopeless, and yet they have been healed, they've come back to health, they've worked on the job now for many years, they've been fine. I've also seen people that were near death and they died. Seen it both ways. I can tell you one thing that is a common characteristic of every one of the ones that I have seen that came from death's door and lived, they're fighters. I said they're fighters. They're fighters. Well, you're not going to fight for something that you're not sure is God's will. You're not going to fight for something that you're not sure is his plan. Long life, satisfaction, and fullness of days is his will for you. Can you say amen? amen? No matter what might come along to try to take you out or tell you otherwise, you need to make up your mind once and for all, no, I am going to live long, I'm going to live full until I am satisfied. Amen. Yeah, but you don't really have a choice. Paul said he did. Yeah, but when your time comes. Look at that scripture that people misquote. Hebrews 9, verse 26 says, talking about Jesus, how that he entered in and offered his blood. It said, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, verse 26 of chapter 9, but now once, everybody say once, once in the end of the world has he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men, what? Once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was what? Once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. What's the emphasis in this passage? Once the Lord died one time, right? He, he made the, the offering, the sacrifice one time. That's all that's necessary. That's why you and I don't still offer rams and goats. Why? Because it's done one time. It was done. And he is not emphasizing a day and date on uh, men dying. What is he saying? It's appointed unto men what? One time. You might say, well, man, why isn't that obvious? When you're dead, you can't die again, can you? Oh, yeah. There is the second death. What he's saying is if the Lord tarries his coming long enough, he didn't promise us that we'd live down here mortally forever. It is appointed unto man to die one time. But those of us that are born again, the second death has no power over, over us. We'll never experience the second death. And if you live long enough, you might not have to die that time. Right? You live long enough, you can see the coming of the Lord. You talk about an amazing event. That's got to be an amazing, amazing, you know, have you ever thought about, the Bible talks about, you know, that people talk about we'll have a new body. Well, that's true, but it's going to be this body. This body is part of the plan of redemption. It's bought and paid for. You and I are going to have this body forever. Now, a lot of times people don't like that, but <laughs> this body is going to be changed. It's going to become immortal incorruptible, and I assure you, you'll be satisfied and happy with it when it's changed. <laughs> but have you ever thought about it? The Bible says the dead in Christ are going to rise first. There are Christians whose bodies you cannot find in the earth. They died centuries ago out in the desert. 
Their, 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 their body decomposed. Their bones, you can't even find them. They, they've been dissolved and the winds have blown them to the four corners of the earth. Where is their body? They're Christians who died out at sea. They were buried at sea. The sharks got them. Where's their body? That was centuries ago. But every molecule and atom is still here. And it would be so thrilling to be one of the ones alive and remaining because you hear the trumpet sound. You see the Lord come. You're still mortal. You're still just like you are right now. But then you, you hear this great sound and from the four corners and four winds of the earth, these bodies come, come back together. And you see the spirit re-enter them and you're going, whoa. Wow! And just about time you think you're getting an, an overload, that glory hits you. Yeah. Woo! I mean, the same thing that happened to the Lord Jesus' body in that tomb on the third day is going to hit you. The quickening of the Holy Ghost is going to flow through your body and you're going to be changed on an atomic level. Glory. You don't want to miss that. You better hang around. It'd be great either way, whether you were already gone or whether you were here, but to just be, you know, to see a lot of this coming down while you're still mortal. Well, hallelujah. Uh, in Ecclesiastes, I want you to just turn there to the third chapter. We're going to look at the third chapter. We're going to look at the seventh chapter. Ecclesiastes, let me give you some clarification on what we said. That scripture does not say it's appointed unto man a time to die. This theory of the three o'clock in the afternoon, no matter what age, where, that is not right. That is not what the Bible teaches. In Ecclesiastes 3, though, you will see something that people could misunderstand and misapply along this line. A lot of you know this, are familiar with this. But uh, in Ecclesiastes 3, and the reason I want you to turn there because there's another scripture I want you to see in the same book. You remember in the beginning of this chapter it says, Ecclesiastes 3, 1, to everything there is a what? Season. Now that's, that's a key word. A season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. Now let's just stop right here. You might say, well, Brother Keith, you just messed up your sermon. You were doing real good. And then you went and pulled that verse. <laughs> Listen, if a verse messes up your message, you better start over. Right? How many of you preachers, you ever had the revelation and you thought, yeah, yeah, well, you're doing real good, and you, just, you think of a verse that messes it up. Well, then you better throw that one in the trash can and start over. There's some things you don't see. Is there a time to die? There is an appropriate season. Remember, that's what he started out talking about was season. Uh, in Job, you don't have to turn there, but in Job, the fifth chapter, in the 26th verse, don't turn there. I want you in Ecclesiastes, we've got something else to see here. But Job 5, 26, he said, you shall come to your grave in a full age, like as a shock of corn comes in his season. That was Job 5, 26. You'll come to your grave in a full age, like what? Like a shock of of corn or wheat comes in what? There is a season when it's not right to reap the grain. Right? You Usually corn in the Bible is talking about wheat, but the principle would be the same if you're talking about yellow field corn that we might call corn. When the, the ear is not even developed, that's not time to harvest it. Right? When it's immature and it's 
you know, still too green. That's not the time. But there is a time when the ears are fully developed, fully mature. It's time. Right? And Job must have believed that because when did he come to the end of his life? 140 years after his trial and test. So I think he came to the, I think he was like a full shock of corn. Right? Aged and satisfied. Now in Ecclesiastes 7, uh, that's why I want you to stay there, turn over to the 7th chapter <coughs> and the 17th verse. Seven seventeen, it says, Be not overmuch wicked, and neither be thou foolish. Why should you die before your time? Can you die before your time? Here are two principal causes of premature death. Foolishness and wickedness. There's a lot of people that, that are not with us anymore, not because they were bad people, it's just because they did something foolish. Handling electricity while your feet standing in a puddle of water <laughs> can cause you to go home early. Right? Not that the Lord took you, it's just you left. <laughs> Are you with me now? There's any number of things. You know, attacking somebody's pit bull <laughs> for no good reason. <laughs> I've been a pilot for a couple of years now, and uh, there's a lot of ways to kill yourself. <laughs> I mean, there's just any number of things you could do. And, uh, you know, if I... If, if I did something totally contrary my, to my training and I went out and stuck that airplane up the side of a mountain or something, and it would be totally wrong for somebody to come out and say, well, God just saw fit to take Brother Keith. He just loved him so much that he just took him, you know. No, Brother Keith didn't pay attention at ground school. <laughs> and Brother Keith's shouting in heaven, but how many do we need to say, what, what is death? For the Christian to die is gain. Gain. Even if we did everything wrong and, we, and we, we, we're out of here. What are we doing? Checking our mansion out? I had the devil trying to mess with me one day about some things. You ever had him try to mess with you, bother you? And he was, you know, I had this problem and I had this problem and I had this other problem. You got a problem. You got a problem. And the Holy Ghost, thank God for the Holy Ghost. He said, uh, you don't have any problems beside him. I thought, yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, Mr. Devil, what you here bugging me? I got no problems besides you. Worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. Let's say I'm dumb. Let's say I miss God. Let's say I zig when I should have zagged. Let's say I give up. I lose everything. I die young. Worst case scenario. What happens? I step away from my body and I go, Whoops. <laughs> okay. I guess we're through with that. <laughs> and here's my angel. And he says, you want the scenic way or you want the quick way? And I say, run me by the Milky Way. I always wanted to see that up close. And so we zip through the, hallelujah, the celestial places. And I get to see Jesus. And I get to see, to die is Game. But now you have to watch that. See, working in healing school, I've worked with people, Christians and ministers that love God, and you know, you can get tired of fighting sickness and disease. You can get tired of dealing with problems, and you can get to the place where it's just a lot easier to go than it is to stay. And people get tempted, and that's why a lot of people are not with us, and maybe some of you, you stood, you prayed, you believed with and for somebody that was a loved one that was sick or had a disease, and, and no, even though you stood and prayed and fasted and did all that you did, they still died. One of the most foolish things that could happen to you is that you feel hard at God. 
God didn't let you down. The Word didn't let you down. Your family member, your friend, they decided to go on. If anybody quit you, it was them to stop standing in faith. The Lord didn't fail you. And don't blame them unless you've been there, you don't know what it's like. I've worked with people close up in healing school. And I'm, I'm telling you, you know, I've seen people, they could have stayed. If they'd have fought, they could have stayed. But did I feel bad at them for leaving? No, no. After everything they've been through, they got tired. They said, I'm, I want to go. Leave me alone. I'm out of here. And, and to be frank with you, I, I'm a young man. I know I've got some gray here, but I'm, I'm a young man. <laughs> but if the Lord told me tomorrow morning, he said, Keith, you've done everything I want you to do. You've run your race. You've finished your course. You can come home if you want to. I'd say, great, I'm ready. Let's go. I'm say, you would? Absolutely. I'd say, I'm out of here. Bye. I'm gone. Why? Because compared to heaven, this place is a garbage can. I'm talking about this world, this earth. It's full of the curse and devils and disease and crazy people. You've been around long enough to know that. But, everybody say but. 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 He's not through with me. He's not through with you. He's got a lot for us to do, and there is no surplus of good workers. The harvest is great. The laborers are few. We need every person to stay and to dig in and to do their job. Now, after, after these teachings and after these, you know, uh, us taking these stand on these things, it's not going to cut it for you to give up and check out early on us. It's not going to work, you know, for you to say, you know, if you, cut, if you leave early on us, you understand that means we got to pick up your workload. We got to do our job plus yours. So when we get to heaven, we may come over to see you. Of course, we'll all be happy and free, of course, and we'll party hardy, but we may catch you on the side of your mansion, you know, and say, hey, man, what's the idea of leaving early? And it won't do any good for you to go, well, I couldn't help it. Because we know that you know you could have stood, you could have fought. Hallelujah. And if God's for you, who can be against you? And if the word of God says it's yours, who's bigger than him? He said, don't be over much wicked. Don't be foolish. Why should you die before your time? The Hebrew literally says, why should you die not in your time? Go with me to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs, the third chapter. Can you stay with me for a few more minutes here? <laughs> Proverbs chapter 3. Now, some of you know these things, but you know, it's, uh, it's not just what you know. It's what you act on. It's being a doer of the word that brings results. And uh, it's fine and dandy to say, yeah, I believe in long life when you're feeling good and sitting in a nice service like this, but that's, that's not really the thing that counts. It's when you're up against the wall. Yeah. It's when you've got two strikes against you, right? When it looks like you're going down for the third time, right. right? It's when you're tired and you're weak and it looks like everything's against you and you feel like, hey, just forget it. Just give up. Just check out. That's the time when you need to find some strength on the inside. We need to let the word of God come ringing back in your ears. And you need to say, it's not time. It's not time. I'm not satisfied. There's other things I need to do. Amen. In Proverbs, the third chapter, Proverbs 3, verse 1, he said, My son, forget not my law, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they what? Add to thee. Skip down to the fourth chapter. Fourth chapter and the tenth verse. 
Proverbs 4.10, Hear, O my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of your life shall be many. The ninth chapter, ninth chapter of Proverbs, verse 10, 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the holy is understanding. For by me your days shall be what? Multiplied, and the years of your life shall be increased. You like the sound of that? Tenth chapter. The 27th verse, 10, 27. This just kind of sums it up both ways here. 10, 27 of Proverbs. The fear of the Lord does what? Prolongeth days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. So again, this proves that there couldn't be this set time that's preset for you regardless of how you live or what you do or what you don't, it's apparent that there are ways we can think and believe and live that will add length to our life. And there are ways that people could live and think and speak that would shorten their days. In Psalm 55, 23, don't turn there, but Psalm 55, 23, it says, bloody and deceitful men shall not live out half their days. Bloody and deceitful men shall not live out half their days. You know, a, a perfect example of that is Judas Iscariot. He was guilty of blood. He was deceitful. He died young, right? We see people dying all around us. We see people in the streets dying. And again and again, they're, they're, they're bloody and they're deceitful. Shall not live out half their days. Well, when we talk about half their days, half of what? When he says, with long life I'll satisfy you and show you my salvation, how long is long? That's a good question. Go back with me to the 90th Psalm, Psalm 90, and let's look at a passage that has been used a whole lot in connection with expected length of life. In Psalm 90, verse 10, Psalm 90, 10, it says the days of our years are threescore years and 10. Now, how many is that? 70. And if by reason of strength, if you're a little stronger than average, then they be fourscore years, that's how many? 80, a score is 20, so that's 80. Yet is the strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. So uh, 70 or 80, is that long? Well, a lot of people don't make it that long, right? I mean, there's a lot of people leaving at 30 and 40 and 50. I mean, if they made it to 80, it'd be a... Amazing thing. Remember what we said the key word was? Satisfaction. That's the key word. Satisfaction. But I submit to you that this verse of Scripture in Psalm 90 was never intended to be the maximum lifespan of a person uh, that, that we Christians should say, well, this is probably the most we could reach for and believe for. For one thing, if you look up at the top, it says a psalm of Moses, right? And Moses, the man of God. And let me just back up and read some of the verses. Sometimes, you know, we, we do ourselves an injustice by, by just pulling a scripture out and not looking at the whole context. Verse um, 3, Psalm 90 says, You turn man to destruction and you say, Return, you children of men. A thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it's past and as a watch in the night. You carry them away as with a flood. Verse 7, we are consumed by your anger and by your wrath are we troubled. Would you confess that over yourself? Huh? 
How many believe that's God's perfect will for us that we say we are being consumed by your anger and by your wrath we're troubled? You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance, for all our days are passed away. How? Not in your blessing, but how? In your wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years, he goes on to say, are 70, or if you're strong, 80. Verse 11, who knows the power of your what? Anger. Let me read to you a footnote from the Amplified Bible on this psalm. Listen to it carefully. This is a footnote in the Amplified Bible on this psalm. It says, this psalm is credited to Moses who was interceding with God to remove the curse which made it necessary for every Israelite over 20 years of age to die before reaching the promised land. Moses says most of them are dying at 70 years. This number has often been mistaken as a set span of life for all mankind. It was not intended to refer to anyone except those Israelites under the curse during that particular 40 years. <clears throat> if, you, if you'll go back and read uh, Numbers, I guess it is, the 14th chapter, I believe it is. Let me see if I can find it here. Yeah, Numbers 14. Then you'll find that the Lord told them that that whole generation that had sinned against him and rebelled against him, he said that they were not going to go into the, the promised land and those from the age 20 and up were not going to make it in. And he also told their children that they were going to bear their sin 40 years. So there's a time frame on this thing, isn't there? All these guys have to be gone before that 40 years is passed uh, by the time it's passed, or else why the Lord would have broken his word to their children. You understand? And so I believe you can see that without, I, I, if we had time, I could spend a lot more on it, but you can see that this, this psalm is applicable to that period of time when they're wandering around out in the wilderness and all the men from age 20 and up were dying, and most of them were dying because there was a limited place of time there before the next generation was going to be able to go in. Most of them were dying at age 70 and even the strongest ones out there weren't making it past 80. And by the time that 40 years was passed, not a one of them, the scripture says in Numbers uh, 26, not a one of them was alive except Caleb and Joshua. Well, then how long is long? If this is not the maximum life expectancy, now tell me again, what's the key word? Satisfied. Go back to Genesis, the sixth chapter. Genesis chapter six. Genesis, the sixth chapter. And look at verse three. Genesis three, six, three. Six, three of Genesis. The Lord said, so who's talking here now? The Lord God. He said, my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. Did God ever say a maximum, or excuse me, an, an approximate lifespan of mankind. Right here. To my knowledge, and I've, I've studied it somewhat, I cannot find any other scriptures, Old Testament or New, that modify this or change this. I mean, we know the approximate lifespan of a dog, of a horse, of a fish, whatever, you know. What's, what should be the approximate lifespan of a human being? So most of you are afraid to even say it. <laughs> now, do we walk by sight? Do we walk by others' experiences? Or do we walk by the Word? 120. Now, anytime you say that, people go, well, uh, mm, yeah, 
But now, Brother Keith, that was back there, way back there, you know, when they were living so long. <laughs> Friend, this is a drastic cut for these guys. Drastic. This, this is a big, big cut. If you just back over to the fifth chapter, if you're right there, don't try to read it all. I'll just mention it to you quickly. Adam lived to be 930 years old. Seth, 912. Enos, 905. That's 900. 905. Now, you'll you get some, you know, theologians that go, ah, ah, these numbers are probably not correct. They're probably just figurative. Look, listen, we believe the Bible. If the Bible said they lived 900 years, then they lived 900 years. The Bible said they went through on dry land and it was dry. Right? That's what separates from us a lot of folks. We believe the Bible. We just, if it said it, we believe it. Jesus was born of a virgin. That's right. How? We don't know, but he did. He was raised from the dead? Yes. How? I don't know, but he did. He did. Kainan lived to be 910. Mahalalil uh, only made it to 895. Jared, 962. Enoch died as a youth at 365. Well, he didn't die, but he, he only made it 365. Because God took him. Methuselah, though, hung around 969 years. People are living almost a millennia. They're living almost a thousand years. And you tell them that people are going to die at 120? That's like telling a hundred year old man that somebody died at age 12. You would think, just a child. It's hard for us to imagine. Why did the Lord say that? He said, my spirit's not always going to strive with man. Why did, he, why did he reduce it to 120? Because we know that this is right before the flood came, and most of the people on the earth were wicked. I mean, the vast majority, only Noah and his household were spared. Wicked. Well, when you're wicked for 900 years, <laughs> it's bad. You think you had to put up with that person for 30 years. 900 years, you can get good at being bad. And God said, I'm tired of this. We're reducing this. 120. And you'll see that right after the flood, men didn't live as long. Things were changed. And uh, I'll just give you some numbers here. Noah lived to be 950 years old, which is in the same category as the other patriarchs. But immediately, you know, his, his life is during the flood, obviously. His son, Shem, made it to 600. Our facts said 438. Eber, 464. Peleg, 239. Do you see what's happening? Serug, 230. Nahor, 230. 148, Abraham 175, jo Isaac 180, Jacob 147, Joseph 110. So within, within just a few hundred years, they came from almost a millennia to down just, just not much over a hundred. But now here's the interesting thing, and I think sometimes something that people have not seen, is that once it got there, to about 110, 20, 30, 40, long in there, it stayed there. Obviously, not everybody's living that long, but you see centuries and centuries later, people still living that long. And if God had set the approximate maximum of a man's life, a woman's life, at 70 or 80, nobody would be living beyond that. Right? And yet they did, and yet they are. 
Do you know that statisticians tell us that right now in the U.S. there are over 50,000 people over age 100? Apparently they didn't believe 70 or 80. <laughs> if one person can do it, another person can do it. Right? You'll see that 500 years later, 500 years after this, Jehoiada lived to be 130. Do you see it dropped, it dropped, but then I'm telling you it leveled off. Well, let's go all the way to the New Testament. Go to Luke, the second chapter. I'm not going to keep you much longer. Luke, chapter 2. What, what, what's that murmuring I hear? What is that? Huh? Luke 2. How many of this is New Testament? How many of this is a long time after Genesis? Right? Luke 2, verse 36. There was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Aser. She was of a great age. Now see, we're talking about how long is long. Before we call somebody old, we need to get a scriptural definition of it. We've got a lot of people falsely accusing the brethren. <laughs> by calling a 60-year-old old. 60 is halfway to 120. Halfway. Everybody say halfway. 60 is halfway. Have you thought about that? And yet you got 45-year-olds talking about, well, I guess I'm just getting old. Well, I'm 50-something I'm now. Whoo, almost halfway. What's a great age? Anna was of a great age. She had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. She was a widow four score and four years. So you got to add 84 plus uh, seven, which is 91. But we don't know how old she was when she got married. Now they got married younger in those days, so let's be conservative. Let's say she got married when she's 13. That put her at what, about 104 or so. Well, if she was 19 or 20 when she got married, just be that much older. And she's not dead. <laughs> right? It's flowing in the Holy Ghost. At 104, saying things so powerful by the Spirit that they're written down for us to read about today. At 104. I tell you, there's some ministers in this place tonight. You have been kind of semi-retired and been thinking about going ahead and fully retired. God's talking to you tonight. He's telling you, you're not old. You're not through. You're not done. Hundred and four. Not dead, not close to dead. Flowing in the Holy Ghost. Let me read some of these to you, then I'm on, I'm on close. This is an excerpt from, uh, I'm, I'm going to give you some modern instances tomorrow night if you can come and be back, some, some interesting stories. These are interesting. But then some other things about our part in making it that long. I mean, we have something to do with it now. we we'll talk about some keys that will enable us to have the, wor the will of God and the, and the full plan, full length of days. In the Adam Clark commentary on Psalm 90, he gives some outstanding instances of longevity in the 1400s, uh, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, and I'm going to give you some on up into the 20th century here. Listen to a few of these, just a few. Agnes Schooner is recorded, and uh, she died somewhere in England at 1499, in the year 1499, at age 119. The countess, certain countess in Ireland, died at 1612 at age 145. It, now this is amazing. They, they have on record that it was an astonishing thing that she renewed her teeth two or three times in her lifetime. Teeth grew back in. It's 
Somebody said, I just don't know. All things are possible to him that believes. Now this is, this is a humorous, interesting thing here. Thomas Parr of Winnington in Shropshire married his first wife at the age of 88. This is a matter of public record. And had two children by her. At the age of 102, he fell in love with a Miss Milton and had an affair. <laughs> by which they had an illegitimate child for which he did penance in the church. <laughs> then, at the age of 120, he married a widow woman. And when he was 130, he still did all the operations of farming on his own farm. He still plowed at 130. He died in 1635 at age 152. He lived through 10 kings and queens of England. <laughs> Henry Jenkins of Ellerton often swam the rivers when he was over age 100. He died in 1670 at the age of 169. These are in the 1400s, 1500s, 1600s. Now here's some uh, more recent ones. Jackson Pollock, Milledgeville, Georgia, this was just uh, two or three years ago. If he hadn't died, he should be about 124 years old. 124, now. They asked him for some advice about living long. He said, trust in God. Just trust in God. And he said, and I've always used Prince Albert tobacco. <laughs> oh. Somebody said, why would you say that? Well, for one, for one thing, I, you know, like I said, I've been a student of this for some time. I, I've, I've tried to see characteristics and common things between people that make it. And uh, the key to longevity is not perfect diet. Contrary to what some people think. You got people that are diet fanatics and are dead at 28. <laughs> now, don't misunderstand me. Don't misunderstand me. You know, somebody said, what about diet? You need to be led by the Holy Ghost. You don't take, need to take anybody's book, anybody's learn a lot of things, but you need to be led. You got one inside you who knows everything about your systems. And if the Lord deals with you, lay that aside, or do this, or follow, then obey Him. But it's much more to it. There, there are some factors, but there's much more to it than perfect diet. Much more. A lot of these guys that I've got records on, they, you know, they, they, their diet's not perfect. <laughs> I'll just say it like that. Walter Williams died in Texas a few years ago at age 125. Kerry White in, uh, in Florida, 116. Uh, I have a couple in here that I might mention to you tomorrow night. They're alive right now at age 120. Right now. If one person can do it, somebody else can do it. Right? It must be available. God said the days of man shall be 120 years. Stand up, why don't you?